So welcome, uh, dear friends, to our satsang uh, this morning. It's always a joy to be with all of you. Today is our study of a fourth Upanishad verse. This is the fourth one we are studying together. I just wanted to remind you very briefly about the verses that we looked at earlier. We started with a verse from Isha Upanishad. In fact, we started with the first verse of Isha Upanishad that you may remember. Isha Vasya Midam Sarvam Yat Kincha Jagatyam Jagat Te Natyakte Na Bhunjita Ma Grida Kasya Swiddharam Everything that exists in this world is pervaded by God, give up and enjoy, do not covet anyone's wealth. And then we looked at another verse from Isha Upanishad, verse 6. Yastu sarvani bhutani atman eva nupashyati sarva bhuteshu chatmanam tatona vichugupsate. A verse that spoke about overcoming of hate, one who sees all beings in the divine Atman and the divine Atman in all beings does not hate, is free from hate. And on the last occasion we met, we took up for study uh, a verse from uh, Katha Upanishad discussing the goals of Sreyas and Preyas, the goals of Accomplishing what we need for life in this world, but also the goal of seeking the divine infinite. Sreyascha preyascha manushyam etastau samparitya vivinakti dhiraha sreyo hi dhiro abhi preyaso vrinite preyo mando yogakshemam vrinite. So each verse is a verse to be heard, to be reflected deeply upon, to be internalized. Each verse is, is transformative. Each verse points, points us to an important way of being in this world. And I just wanted to add that the kind of study that we are engaged in with these verses, this deep spiritual study, is not to be measured by quantity, the amount of verses we study, the amount of texts we, we study, but by the depth of our, of our study, the depth of our understanding. As I reminded you when we read the first verse of the Upan, Isha Upanishad, Mahatma Gandhi once said famously that if we lost everything, we lost all texts, but we had only the first verse of Isha Upanishad, this verse will be enough. It provides enough meaning to live one's life meaningfully in relation to the divine. So this morning, I'm... Uh, Focusing on another verse from Katha Upanishad. This verse comes from the first chapter, second section, verse 24 of Katha Upanishad. And here is the verse in Sanskrit. Na virato duscharita na shanto na samahitaha Nashanta manaso vapi pragya nenainam apnuyat. A brief translation, which of course I will discuss in detail. No one who has not turned away from unethical actions, no one who has not turned away from unethical actions, whose senses are not under control, 
whose mind is not collected, whose mind is not at rest, can attain this Atman by knowledge. So in the last talk, as I mentioned, we discussed the two goals of Preyas and Sreyas. Sreyas, as we said, is the higher goal of human life. And the Upanishads identify Sreyas, equate Sreyas with the desire for the infinite divine, the infinite Brahman. And prayers are those things that we need for a good, decent, dignified life in this world. We spoke about the importance of, of balance between prayers, the goals of life in this world, and sreyas, the understanding of the divine. The Upanishads also advise us that when we are desirous of pursuing Sreyas, desirous of understanding Brahman, the infinite one, we must go to a teacher, a guru. Saguru, Saguru Meva Bhigachet in Mundaka Upanishad. Go to a teacher. And this instruction is repeated in other sacred texts. The Bhagavad Gita, for example, in the fourth chapter, speaks of becoming a disciple, asking questions, serving the teacher. Tad vidhi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya. Ask questions of the teacher, learn by questioning. And uh, these uh, texts also inform us of the qualifications of the teacher. Mundaka Upanishad is famous for this description of the teacher and uh, describes the right teacher, the qualified teacher, with two important terms. And these terms are Srotriyam and Brahmanishtam. Srotriyam, Brahmanishtam. Srotriya means one who knows the Sruti. Sruti here meaning the Vedas, in this case, particularly the Upanishads. So the first requirement is a, a deep knowledge of the Sruti, of the Upanishads, and other, other texts we may add, like perhaps Bhagavad Gita. This would be a requirement for a qualified teacher in any religious tradition. He or she should know the sacred teachings of that, of that tradition. The second qualification is the one that is central, of central importance to the verse that we are studying today from Katha Upanishad. So the second qualification of the teacher mentioned in the Upanishad is Brahmanishtam. Nishtam means firmness, centeredness, planted in. So Brahma Nishtam is centeredness, firmness, a life centered in Brahman, a life centered in the divine. In other words, the teacher's life and the teacher's way of being in this world must reflect, must express the teacher's knowledge of Brahman. The teacher's thoughts, words, and action should reflect the teacher's knowledge. This is called Brahma Nishtam, the integration of knowledge and being, knowledge and way of life. The knowledge of God, in this case, we're using the word Brahman, transforms us in many ways. It is transformative in many ways. 
It aims to change how we understand ourselves, who we are, how we understand and see other living beings, and how we see the world. It changes our relationships with all three, with ourselves, with other beings, with the world. It transforms our self-understanding by awakening us to the central teaching, the truth of the Upanishads, that Atman is Brahman. I am Atma, Brahman. This knowledge, as we have seen, liberates us from greed, awakens us to love and to compassion for all. This transformation brought about by understanding, by knowledge, also results in a deep ethical change. It is a transformed way of being in the world. And as I said, it transforms our relationships with others. This is what Brahmanishtam means. It describes the ethical virtues that are manifested, that are reflected in the life of someone who knows Brahman, who knows the divine. And these virtues are described in various sacred texts, including the Upanishads. These virtues include freedom from hate, compassion for others, concern for the well-being of others, commitment to the, to the common good, among other, other virtues. So what the Upanishads emphasize is that teaching about Brahman is best received from someone who knows the tradition, who knows the sacred text, the Sruti, who is a Srotriyam, but also who has internalized, assimilated these teachings and who exemplifies an ethical way of being in the world. We can never truly see into another's heart or into another's mind, but we're able to see his or her actions in, in, in the world. So virtue is not only vital as a qualification of the teacher, but this Katha Upanishad verse emphasizes, and here is the, the central point, that no one will come to know God, the divine Brahman, without earnestly striving to live a virtuous life, to live an ethical life. So here is the verse again. Na virato duscharita, na shanto na samahitaha, na shanta manaso vapi pragyanenainam apnvyat. So this verse specifies a number of conditions necessary, beginning with a turning away from ethical, unethical, or immoral conduct, which is called here duscharitat. Charita is action, duscharitat. So the prefix dush means wrong, immoral, unethical, or if you, if you wish, evil. So duscharitat therefore means or signifies turning away from unethical or immoral actions. In other words, no one will come to know Brahman without turning away from unethical actions. What constitutes unethical actions is not specified in this verse, but these are detailed in other, other parts of the Upanishads and in other, in other Hindu uh, texts. If you want a, an easy summary, then I recommend looking at 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, where we have a very detailed elaboration of what, con what constitutes duscharita art, unethical conduct. And these include, interestingly, acquiring wealth by unjust methods, 
causing suffering to others, inflicting pain on others, arrogantly regarding oneself as superior to others, destroying others to fulfill, to fulfill one's own desires. And the last one I'd mention is performing worship as outward show. So along with giving up or turning away from unethical actions, this Katha Upanishad verse also mentions uh, sense control, shanta, control of one's mind, shanta manasaha, and having also a focused mind, samahita. So here is the question for us. Why does this Upanishad stipulate so clearly, so unambiguously, that one must turn away from unethical action as a requirement for knowing the divine, for knowing Brahman? One might argue with the verse in this way. Well, we are speaking here about knowledge. In Sanskrit, Brahma Jnana. And why, why, do, why does one need to, be, to cultivate virtue, to pursue knowledge? We do not ask for virtue if one wants to study other disciplines, if one wants to study information, technology, medicine, chemistry, physics, economics, sociology, philosophy, the stipulation for entering into medical school is not duscheritat, it's not turning away from unethical actions. What's so special about coming to know God, the divine, coming to know Brahman, that the Upanishad says that you have to turn away from unethical actions, and one who has not turned away will not know. What is so different about knowledge in this case, in this example? So this is a question and let us examine this a little bit, a little bit further. The knowledge of Brahman, as we are taught in the Upanishads, occurs in the mind. It's very clear. There's a very beautiful uh, verse, again in the same Katha Upanishad, which says, Manasa eva idam aptavyam. That this Brahman is to be known in the mind only. Manasa eva, in the mind alone. Manasa eva idam. This is to be known with the instrument of the mind. So clearly the mind is the instrument of knowledge here. But in this case, and this is very important, this knowledge, even though it, the mind is the instrument, is not the knowledge of an object outside, like, like a tree or looking at the snowfall this morning here in Minnesota. It is not the knowledge of an object outside or an object inside, like a thought that one might have in one's mind. A thought is an internal object. A tree is an external object. So it is not the knowledge of, a, of an object. It is the knowledge of oneself, which is not an object. So let me give you an example to make this clear. So think, think, think of, think with me. Suppose I ask you a question. Do you know peace, shanti? Do you know peace? You may answer in the affirmative positively by saying, yes, I know what peace means. And then you, you may tell me, well, peace is mental quietness or peace is contentedness. But you are giving me a definition 
of the word peace. Peace is mental quietness. Peace is contentedness. And I'm asking you, if you know the condition that the word peace describes. So how does one know the condition of peace? One knows the meaning of peace in this sense by becoming peaceful. So you can, you can know the word meaning of peace, but not necessarily what peace is. To know what peace is, one has to become peace. One has to become peaceful. To know peace, we have to still the, the, the tumult in our minds. We must become peace. To know peace, you have to become peace. A mind that is not peaceful cannot know the meaning of peace. We'll only know the meaning of the word, but not what the condition means. And you can, you know, you can add examples to this. You take the word love, for example. One may know the word meaning of love, but never know what it means to love. To know what it means to love is to become loving. Same is true for contentment or joy. These are examples of states that you can only know what they mean by actually becoming that, that condition. So knowing the meaning of the word Brahman is not the same as knowing Brahman. Saying that Brahman is infinite, Brahman is reality, is not knowing Brahman, it's knowing the word meaning of, of Brahman. So in other kinds of knowledge, and I give a whole list of examples before, study of chemistry, physics, economics, information technology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The mind is also the instrument of knowledge, but the mind does not have to become like that which it seeks to know. So my mind does not have to become like a virus <laughs> in order to study the nature of, of, of a virus. But if I have to understand myself, which is peace, which is love, which is contentedness, then my mind has to become peaceful, loving, contented. In this case, the instrument of knowledge has to become like that which it seeks to know. And this is what is unique here. Brahma vid Brahmaiva Bhavati, the knower of Brahman in Upanishad, the knower of Brahman becomes Brahman. Brahma vid Brahmaiva Bhavati. The knower of a virus doesn't become a virus. But in this case, the knower becomes what she seeks to know. In addition to speaking of turning away from unethical actions, this Katha Upanishad verse also mentions the need for self control, sense control, sorry, mental control, mental concentration, Shanta, Shanta Manasaha, Samahitaha. These are all related. In addition to the great suffering that unethical actions cause to others, such actions also cause agitation and turmoil in our minds. Mind is, we lack self-control, sense control, mental control. When the mind is held in the grip of greed and unethical actions, it becomes, as the Bhagavad Gita describes, bound by hundreds of nooses. This is the language of the Gita. Bound by hundreds of nooses of insatiable desires, anger, hypocrisy, arrogance. It is consumed by plotting to destroy others in pursuit of these desires. There is no practice of restraint as far as the senses or the mind is concerned. Thoughts race in multiple directions following objects of crazing. 
of cra craving. Such a mind, the Upanishad teaches, will not will not come to a knowledge of Brahman. So from you start from unethical actions, duscharita, and then you move to lack of sense control, lack of mind control, lack of lack of focus, and so on. So they all uh, interrelated. But there is another important reason why the Upanishad specifies so clearly turning away from unethical actions as a prerequisite, as a condition of knowing the divine. The knowledge of Brahman, as I emphasized before earlier, is ethically transforming. It doesn't leave us as we were before. If it does, then we, are, we don't really know. It is transformative. This is, this is the beauty of it. We saw, in, we saw this in verses we have studied already. Isha Upanishad tells us that the knower of Brahman is free from hate. The knower of Brahman does not, con, does not um, crave the wealth of, of others. The Bhagavad Gita tells us that the know of Brahman is rejoices when others are happy and is pain when others suffer. The knowers of Brahman don't regard anyone as an enemy. They are friendly towards all, they are compassionate, they are forgiving. All of these are transformative expressions of what it means to know God, to know the divine. It expresses itself, to put it simply, it expresses itself in a life of virtue. So here is the point. If virtue is the outcome or the end, the expression of knowing Brahman, then virtue also has to be the means. If the end is virtue, the means must also be virtuous. In other words, the path to Brahman is paved with virtue. The means must become like the end. An end that is virtuous will not be attained by means that lack virtue. And when the Upanishads speak of cultivating virtue, I want to make this clear, it is not the perfection of virtue. That's a that's an ideal that is a lifelong quest. So it is not the perfection of virtue that is being discussed. It is the resolve. It is the turning away, the commitment to turn away from that is being lifted up here. It is this resolve, this commitment that matters. And uh, some some of you might recall, you know, that beautiful verse of Bhagavad Gita from 9th chapter. That even if the most unethical person, apichet sudurachara, bhajate maam ananyabhav, even if the most unethical person turned to me, this is Krishna speaking, turned to me with undivided love, ananyabhav. Bhajate maam ananya bhak. Sadhu reva samantavya. Samyak vyavasito hisaha. I regard that person as virtuous. Not because he has or she has become virtuous in some perfect way, but because of his or her resolve. Because of the sincere desire to achieve. Virtue. So the emphasis here is on the right resolve, on sincerity of purpose. The problem is not imperfection. The problem is hypocrisy. The absence, absence of sincere striving to cultivate virtue. So returning once again to that Upanishad description of the teacher, as one who knows the teachings of the Upanishads and who exemplifies virtue in his or her life. 
It is important to note that teachers in the Upanishads taught their students not only by their words, but just as much by their actions and their example. This is an ancient tradition. In their teachers, students saw what knowledge meant, what it meant to incorporate these teachings in day-to-day -day life. They lived in the homes of their teachers. They lived with their teachers. They had the opportunity to observe their daily actions. They learned what spirituality meant by close association with their teachers. Instruction was not by Zoom. This is, this is what the ideal of, of Sat Sangha, Sata Sangha means. The closeness, the company, the association with the good, the association with the, the virtues. And when I found it you know, so powerful that when students graduated after this life of study with their teachers, the teachers always reminded them about ethics. Here's, here's one example, a teacher speaking to his, um, to his class. This is in Taitri Upanishad. Ritamcha swadhyaya pravachanane cha. So go out into the world, study and teach, Ritamcha, but be righteous. Ritamcha, Swadhyaya, Pravachanane, Cha. Study and teach, but practice righteousness. Satyamcha, and then he says, Satyamcha, Swadhyaya, Pravachanane, Cha. Study and teach, but practice truth. Tapascha swadhyaya cha, swadhyaya pravachanane cha. Study and teach, practice self discipline. Damascha swadhyaya cha, swadhyaya pravachanane cha. Study and teach, but control yourselves. Shamascha, and he adds, Swadhyaya pravachana nature. Control your minds. So he's in, 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 encouraging them to continue to be scholars, to study deeply and to teach, but to do so, cultivating all of these virtues that he mentions ritam, satyam, tapas, dhamma, shama, righteousness. In other words, righteousness and learning. Ethics and learning, knowledge and ethics were inseparable in the Upanishads. And we can add these to any professions. Ritam, Satyam, Tapas, Shama, Dhamma. Practice your professions, but do so with fidelity, with loyalty to all of these ethical virtues. So this Katha Upanishad verse reminds us powerfully of the deep connection between spirituality and ethics. A connection that I believe, and I chose this verse partly for this reason, a connection that I believe is being rapidly lost. So I can give you so many examples. Yoga. And this is true of other forms of Hindu spirituality, are widely taught today with little or no regard for the core ethical values. These have been watered down into practices for physical well being, and there's nothing wrong with physical well being, but with little or no regard for the ethical foundations that are to be found at the root of all of these practices. 
so that the religious quest has become a private search for self well-being with little regard for ethics or the quality of one's relationships in this in this world and we forget that patanjali the great systematizer of the tradition of yoga started his great work the yoga sutras with with ethics non hurting ahimsa truth satya non stealing asteya self control sense and mind control brahmacharya generosity and sharing aparigraha ethics gets divorced separated from religion when religious practices are overwhelmingly centered on costly ritual costly ritual practices with little or no attention to moral and ethical transformation rituals are beautiful but the underlying purpose is transformation moral and ethical and when this vision is lost then something very fundamental gets overlooked and spirituality becomes irrelevant to life in the world and its a, its potential to contribute to creating better communities is is lost so let me uh, conclude with one final observation about this katha upanishad verse that i am sharing with you um in today's meditation and let me return back to the verse na virato duscharitan na shanto na samahitah na shanta manaso vapi pragyane nayam ne nayam apnuyat no one who has not turned away from unethical conduct whose senses are not under control whose mind is not collected or whose mind is not at rest can attain knowledge of the divine of brahman and i want to close by calling your attention to something very important here maybe you have seen it already i call your attention to the sequence in this text i think it's a very important sequence that the teacher is pointing out where does he begin he begins with the turning away from unethical action that's the first na virato duscharitat turning away from unethical actions that's where he starts one who has not turned away from unethical actions who and then he adds whose senses are not under control whose mind is not collected or whose mind is not at rest can attain this knowledge of the divine this is significant this sequence why does he start with this turning away from unethical actions because i think it is possible in a certain way it is possible to attain to have what one might call sense control focus of mind etc without turning away from unethical actions from harmful actions i mean we can we can think of so many historical examples but let me give you one that you know we will all be familiar with hitler responsible for the killing of over 6 million jews he lived a very ascetic lifestyle he was vegetarian he did not drink alcohol he did not smoke his mind was very focused all of his thoughts were centered focused on a single purpose restoring germany to greatness 
but by any means. By the slaughter of over six million human beings. So it is not enough to speak of sense control or even mind control. We have to speak about ethics. We also have to ask about the purpose to which one applies these qualities. The foundation is an ethical one. That's why Patanjali starts his Yoga Sutras with ethics. Ethics is, is at the heart of the Upanishadic teachings. When sense and mind control are associated with turning away from unethical actions, these qualities take on a moral character. If we speak of sense control and so on without the ethical dimension, then they are just that. And they may be applied to, 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 to good purposes, they may be applied to harmful purposes also. Having a focused mind is an instrument that can be put to both moral and immoral ends, ethical or unethical ends. And so this is the reason why the teacher begins with the necessity, and it comes the first line in the verse, turning away from unethical actions. There's no finding of God without, a, without the resolve to live a virtuous life. And we must be wary of any teaching that does not prioritize ethics. Any spirituality that lacks ethics should make us all suspicious. So I will stop there, invite your thoughts or comments, but this is the question, you know. You know, what, have, what do we learn from this verse? What have we learned today? What do we see clearer as a result of the meditation on this verse that we have, we have done even in this short uh, time together? So, thank you very much. Oh, Professor Rambachan, you talked about Hitler. Was he a devout religious Christian also? Because you told me so many quality. How was his religiosity? I, you know, formally he had a, you know, religious identity. Uh, I mean, Germany, most Germans at that time, in one way or the other, came from overconnected with Christian, Protestant Christian um, traditions. What exactly, you know, how seriously he took that, I, I, I doubt very much. Um, Arunji, I, I don't think religion, um, in the sense in which I am speaking about it. Um, as leading us to compassion and care for others and the practice of ahimsa meant anything to him. His religion was his nation. Yes. I would put it in, in that way, in the greatness of, of uh, Germany for which he would do anything. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anant. It's an excellent, excellent talk. And when you were speaking about all the virtues, uh, two things came to my mind. A few months back, Dr. Sane discussed a number of virtues that we must follow, values, primarily taken from Bhagavad Gita. And then he made a comment that if you have all of these values, which include the ones that you talked about today, it is possible, it is possible, but not guaranteed, that you will have knowledge of the Atman. Yeah. But if, if these values are absent, the ones that you mentioned and the ones that Dr. Sane mentioned, then Atma Jnana is impossible, which is what this verse emphasizes. So the ethical life takes the topmost uh, place in all of these values. And it also reminded me of the shloka in Bhagavad Gita, where Bhagavan Sri Krishna says, for the one who does not have a contemplative mind, there is no peace. And mm -hmm. if there is no peace, there is no happiness. Ashantasya, 
Kutasukam Nasti Buddhira Yuktasya Racha Yuktasya Bhavana Racha Bhava Yatishantihi Ashantasya Kutasukam. So your idea of this was a new thing that I learned. If you want to appreciate peace, your mind should be peaceful. If you want to appreciate love, your mind should be loving. I, I had not thought about that way. Very beautifully explained. And everything that you say today does not contradict the other values that Dr. Sani had discussed earlier. Yes. No, I agree with you fully, um, Prasanna, in what you have added to our discussion. Um, and that's a very beautiful verse from Bhagavad Gita that you cited, Ashantas Putas Sukham. I I um you know I think that we and this is just to amplify what you are saying, but in a very general way. You know, as a as a teacher myself, you know, I've taught for over 35 years at the college level. And I think that there is a crisis um, that we are really facing in the sense, and the crisis is the divorce between knowledge and ethics. Um, it's an ancient ideal that, that uh, we have in the Upanishads, that all knowledge, you know, ethics form the foundation of, of learning and they are inseparable. And I think that, you know, we are witnessing today the complete disassociation of ethics from, from knowledge. And I, somehow I think, you know, the future of our civilization, our culture needs, requires the bringing back together of mm -hmm. ethics at the center of um, learning. And part of the problem is the absence of moral exemplars in public life. Who are the moral exemplars? You know, if we ask ourselves, who are the moral exemplars? Of course, the family should be a place of exemplary moral conduct. But when we look to our public life, it's very difficult today to find the moral exemplars um, who are, are there. So I think this is a very deep um, problem. But I thank you very much for that comment. Naina, you were going to add something. Yeah, I, I just had a, a short question. <laughs> Whenever, you know, there's so many definitions for dharma. But to me, if somebody said, give me an immediate definition for the word dharma, the first thing that comes to my mind is ethical behavior. I mean, there's so many other, it can be expanded infinitely. But, you know, we, and we in our own lives try to turn away from an unethical practices, we are very satya, we are good, we are generous, we are compassionate. We, but then how is it that there's so much, and there's so many good people, as they say in this world, but it's not just personally you turn away from it, but you should not be able to tolerate it in others as well. You should see it, you should discriminate that there is something unethical, and we, we, I think we should take action on that or, or do something as they say. So, you know, all the other things fall into place, the control of senses and you said, focus the mind. And, but you gave us a great example of Hitler. He did all of those things, but he had no ethics. So therefore I see many different, I mean, perhaps not quite as much as Hitler himself because he had the opportunity to do what he did. But, uh, but others also I see in the society, you know, equally going in the absolute long, wrong direction. And I, I just feel that all of us have got to be alerted to that also as part of the discussion. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Naina. I think I hear you speaking very strongly for bringing these values into the public sphere and advocating um, for them and, and challenging what is unethical. I think that's a very valuable direction. Anand? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it greatly. Uh, a little host voice, so forgive me. Um, yes, I'm glad that you emphasize the batting order of Patanjali, where out of the Ashtanga Yoga, the first is Shama and Dhamma, ending up ultimately with Samadhi. 
So unless you have a proper grounding of the ethical values, Shama and Dhamma, you cannot have the penthouse on the top floor. Uh, other thing which I can just uh, think about is uh, when those uh, negative values are overcome, positive values are instilled in your life. It is like in the backyard of our home where the water is absolutely still in the morning, absolutely without any waves on it, peaceful. And then you're able to see the bottom very clearly. So when those negative forces are no longer existing mm -hmm. and the positive values become inherent part of your nature, you're able to see your own true self just like the bottom I'm talking about, that bottom is basically for true nature. So I think that is so critical, as you rightly emphasize, that only when we get away from negative tendencies, the things that disturb our mind, take the quietude away from our mind, mm -hmm. then only you're able to see and reconnect with you to nature. So enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Shishi. Professor uh, Anand. Uh, yes, please. This is Bala. Thank you again for... Uh, wonderful uh, uh, discourse on a very complicated topic. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the way I, I would summarize today's discourse is uh, the path to true knowledge actually is a combination of spiritual practices, as uh, Professor Prasanna mentioned about the values. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of self-reflection. Mm -hmm. And then the guidance of uh, teachers that you mentioned. Um, I think this is something that all of us are struggling in contemporary world. Uh, the, the benefit of a wise teacher, the, the, in the absence of which, of course, you try to associate yourself with like-minded people who are honest and straightforward and follow ethical practices. But uh, have you, I'm sure you've had this question in terms of how do you uh, find a wise teacher in this contemporary environment and uh, to go forward? Because I think the, the classic example that you mentioned about Hitler, I mean, if, if he had a wise teacher, whether he would have changed his ways, it's, it's very hard to know. But yes. uh, that's a very, very... Uh, uh, impactful example of a person who leads a very straightforward life in his personal life, but who has got all these extraneous things that were totally unethical. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, how would one go about uh, in this contemporary world to find, quote unquote, a wise teacher? It's a very good. Now, first of all, your comments were accurate and in terms of you know the issues that you lift up um balaji and it's a such a important um question to this so and i would i want to, i would want to answer your question or at least respond to your question by going back to to verse right not the kata upanishad verse but i i briefly mentioned the mundaka upanishad which sort of directs the student to the teacher, but says, this is the teacher you should go to. And then there was the, those two words, you know, first of all, the teacher must be knowledgeable in the Sruti. Uh, and here, particularly in the Upanishad. So, you know, we, we, we had, we have in the Hindu tradition, this idea of the spiritual lineage, the Sampradaya. Yeah. Um, so that when you look at a teacher, the, the question that of, one should ask is, you know, what is your lineage? Who did you study with? Who was your, who was your guru? And I'm saying that is important because there is a proliferation today, uh, Balaji, of teachers who are self-appointed. Yeah. They don't, they not, they not, they not belong to a, a spiritual lineage. Yeah. So that's why, you know, we, we always begin by acknowledging that, that, that spiritual lineage. And I, there are teachers today who are clearly, you know, in that, in that traditional lineage. So I would say that is the, be, be cautious 
of the one who is self-appointed. <laughs> yeah. Look to the look to the the the, the traditionals the tradition's heritage, you know, that lineage of Guru, Shishya, uh, that succession of Guru, um, Shishya. And we should not, as I said, hesitate to question. So that would be the first thing. The second, maybe a little more difficult um, to quickly discern, but the Upanishads say that, you know, you should, we should, we should ascertain whether the teacher is a Brahmanishtam. In other words, he, he, he or she knows the sruti, but that's not enough. He or she must be someone who has assimilated, internalized, and lives out the meaning of the, of the tradition, lives out the meaning. So we have to look for knowledge and way of, way of being. Um, and, and that may take a little more careful discernment, Balaji, to, um, to decide. Nothing, I think, you know, sometimes undermines the the shraddha or the fate of a student when a teacher fails to live up to what he or she is is teaching. It, it's a very unsettling experience um, and very common also. Um, you know, the teacher who says, you know, do as I say, but don't do as I do is not the Upanishadic idea. <laughs> that is um, presented. And I said, as I said, you know, we are not looking for perfection in virtue, yeah. but sincerity. Sure. We all, you know, we are all fallible human beings and we will all uh, commit errors, but we must be ready to acknowledge that and um, to show sincerity of, of purpose. So there is, you know, there is the intellectual dimension, which is through the knowledge, and there is also the moral and ethical dimension which is the Brahman Nishtam idea. I mean, when these two come together, I think you get a good teacher because it is possible. Uh, yeah. But think about this also. And there are many very, very good people. And there may be many people who are probably Brahman Nishtas also. They are very well in, 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 in the knowledge of Brahman, but then they may not have the skills to teach because they don't have the Sruti knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they are not Srotriyam. Uh, so they they live very virtuous um, lives, but teaching is teaching requires a little more than that. It requires a knowledge of the tradition, a knowledge of the methods of imparting knowledge, which only comes from the the sampradaya, the experience of having a deep study and association with with a teacher. So that's how I would respond to your good good question. Thank you. I, I also have a question. I thought this presentation was was absolutely revelatory. It 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 cast a light on many things that I had seen before, but you put them together in a way that was really really wonderful. And it, I wanted to ask a question not about the ethical dimension, but those other two components in controlling the senses and stilling the mind. That word controlling is a word for me because it implies that the person doing the controlling already knows what needs to be done, already knows what kind of input from the outside world should be admitted and what should be rejected. If you, if you in the usual sense of the word controlling. And uh, the same applies, I think, to the mind that if you want, you know, if you are instructed to control the mind or to somehow willfully still the mind, are you not shutting out new understandings? Are you not doing that on the basis of the space where you already are, but what you want is to grow? So, so too much control is problematic for me. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting, <laughs> a very interesting observation, <laughs> Johnny. And I would agree with you if, if shutting um, off the mind uh, that means not opening the mind um, to new learning uh, that is possible in your sense by 
keeping an open mind, as we say, <laughs> keeping an open mind. So if control of the mind implies not having open-mindedness, then I think what you are saying is eminently, um, eminently true. And, uh, and I think, unfortunately, we do find that too much, perhaps in, in religious traditions uh, where control of the mind becomes close-mindedness, if I'm hearing you correctly, where con mind controls become becomes close-minded. And I don't think that that is a healthy thing. And I would agree with you on that. Um, here, in this Upanishadic sense, I think sense control, uh, Dhamma, and mind control, Shama, have much more to do with controlling the negative, you know, tendencies of the mind that are born out of, of greed, etc. But I think I would want to commend what you're saying that open mindedness is a virtue. And um, open mindedness is really where we keep ourselves open to, to new learning to new possibilities, to new understanding, and which you connect with growth. And I, I, I agree. I agree the, with you. The experience that brought that to mind for me was all the time that I spent walking in nature and, and taking photographs. Um, if I were too focused, there would be a ton of things that I would never recognize. Yes. I would have made a prejudgment, <laughs> right? Yes, yes. In the sensory domain as well as in the mind domain. Yes, yes. So, I mean, that's an, a, another I mean, dimension of what you're saying, which is that if, if, if sense control means, you know, that we, means a kind of a blinkered, <laughs> a blinkered way of uh, encountering or experiencing the world, and it becomes really problematic. And we must be, ready always to also interrogate and to question our own assumptions so that we are not, you know, we don't limit the horizon. Um, in your case, you know, you're speaking of nature, but I think it has much wider applications also. Um, Johnny, I mean, I, I know the truth personally from what you are, are saying. And in my case, it, it has come a lot through learning from people who are different from me. And, and whose different perspectives uh, uh, continue to be so enriching in my in my own life. But if I was not open to them, I would not that enrichment would not have occurred. That ongoing enrichment. Let me let me say that ongoing enrichment would not would not be possible. Thank you for that. Important. Yes, um, there was about mind control. Like one is a suggestion by Mahatma Gandhi, which says, don't see bad, don't uh, bad, and don't uh, uh, speak bad, which is like Ma Mahatma Gandhi's three, three monkey. And that was one of the ethic which was given to us like as a childhood. But when you do that, you allow the bad to flourish because you let him do the thing, which is, you know, he can, without any... When stopping, they can continue doing it. Uh, so, but the mind control, uh, what we say in the say meditation, is not about you know stopping any ideas to come in. It is about detaching yourself and be above the mind and be in control as to or you know to be able to see what mind is doing. So that we don't get involved, don't flow with it. That if the, there's a anger input comes, we don't get angry because we know, okay, this is mind getting angry. So that is uh, detaching yourself, not being in the control of mind is the uh, you know direction there. Not to be saying that, okay, we'll shut all these ideas out, yes. uh, whether it good or bad, anything comes in, but you detach yourself and see mind acting on it. The, the uh, idea that yeah, it's a very good um, again, you know, I think it's a very useful 
Uh, and you know, connecting with what um, Naina had said before, I, I, you know, we're all familiar with Gandhiji's famous three monkeys, you know, um, see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil. And yes, if you take that to, as you said, rightly said, if you take that to, to, to one extreme, you know, the only way we can contest what we know to be wrong in the world is by seeing it. Um, if we don't see and are clear about what is unjust, what is oppressive, what is wrong, then, you know, that is the first step to challenging it. So, I mean, he was, you know, maybe we we all, so I agree with you. And uh, perhaps one has to, you know, look a little bit deeper and see what was the intent of 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 Gandhiji when he when he said that, but I, I mean he himself, <laughs> Arunji, whatever one may think about him, people have different views today. Clearly, he knew that British colonialism was a wrong thing, <laughs> and I must I must combat it. And he chose his own ways to combat it, but he was not blind to the injustices of of uh, of imperialism, of of colonialism, of certain kinds of social practices. So clearly, you know, he was not. He didn't take his own words to to be a literal closing of the eyes to what is unjust and and what um, inflicts suffering on others. But in doing that, perhaps he always also felt when he said, you know, that one should speak no evil. That that even even you know when when you point out what is wrong, um, you identify what is wrong. You also do it in a way that. Um, is always hopeful for uh, the transformation of the wrong of the wrongdoer as well. You know, you condemn the act, but not not um, not the not completely um, shut the doors to the to the moral transformation of the one who is doing wrong. In that sense, you know, he had a certain optimism about human nature. So I think we we can also look deeper at, at what he meant. But his own life is an example that. He was not literally blind to what was going, what he thought to be wrong. So maybe one last, we are at 11.43, maybe one last comment, if anybody, and we can close. You know, just a, a quick one on Johnny's uh, observation. Yes, to, me, to me, it seems that it's a question of who is the boss. The Is your mind the boss or is your intellect the boss? And clearly, it needs to be the intellect. So that is, to me, what it means by controlling the mind. That intellect in is in charge, and it doesn't let your mind go here and there um, at will, so to speak. Yeah, I think Johnny will say intellect has to also be open. <laughs> <laughs> Buddhi, Buddhi. Yes, and surely, you know, in the order of things, you know, we distinguish between Buddhi and Manas, and we put Buddhi as the, as you rightly said, on the control. But um, Buddhi is also not the absolute, um, and uh, Buddhi can also be, I think in Johnny's terminology, Buddhi can also be constricted. Would you say so, Johnny? Well, I don't understand these this, these uh, sort of classes <laughs> well enough to uh, express any views. <laughs> no, the, the word buddhi is, you know, it's a, it's a Sanskrit distinction. I mean, they are just different dimensions of the same instrument, which we call the internal instrument. When it is, when it wavers and it's in, indecisive, you know, we speak of it as manas or mind. And when it is guided by reason and decisiveness, we speak of it as 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 buddhi, so you know, we, uh, you, in the chariot analogy that is used in Bhagavad Gita and Katha Upanishad, you have the senses, then you have the the mind. With, uh, the horses are like the senses, and the reins are like the mind, and then the one who holds the reins is the buddhi or the intellect. Um, well, see, uh, because, my, my yeah. thought is that we continue to learn through our senses. Yes. So yes. to say that the intellect is the boss. It continues to be problematic for me that that in a way is saying that the experiences mm -hmm. that you are aware of because your senses are working properly that those would no longer be a source of wisdom yeah and, that i i understand and i agree with um that uh, I mean, you're you making a case of openness um, to the diversity and the richness of experience of the world 
is no different than driving a car. I mean, you want all the sensory equipment functioning all the time, but that, that is not in charge, the driver is. The driver may change their opinion about what is the wise course of action depending on what sensory input comes in. Right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> control, control does not mean that you have shut things off. Control means the ability to steer. It, it entails free judgment. That's my problem. It entails judgment. judgment. Yeah. No, I mean, maybe it's the question of how the words are being defined. But to me, control is you want all kinds of inputs. That That's not controlling any uh, you know, sensory inputs is not what should be. It is what you do with it and what decision you make on the basis of it, which is what I'm calling the role of intellect. So the intellect is deciding the final answer on the basis of all these inputs, which should not be shut off by any means. Okay, maybe uh, Desaiji will give the last comment. This is to be continued. <laughs> yeah, I just, just wanted to make one comment that even those who are unethical, I think their inner heart, uh, because we all have Atma, and in this inner heart always tells you what is right and what is wrong. So the unethical behavior uh, our own heart tells us that this is unethical. That is the beauty of this whole thing is what is ethical and what is unethical is very easy because if you truly listen to your own heart, that is my opinion. Well, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, we could. this is a very beautiful topic and we have you know, expanded it in very interesting directions. Um, I'm sure we will find another way to continue, but let us close now. Om Purnamadav Purnamidam Purnaat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, shanti. 